Well, I have a, a couple songs uh, floating through my head today. One of them is the Beatles' birthday song. You say, it's your birthday. Na, 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 na. It's my birthday too. And it is today, your birthday, my birthday. It's the birthday of the church. Pentecost is our birthday. And there's reason to celebrate. Uh, Pentecost is a big deal. Uh, Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit descended in Acts chapter 2, and the church was born. Pentecost is a big deal. Did you know that in Italy, uh, where my people are from actually, they drop uh, uh, red rose petals from the ceiling to signify tongues of fire uh, dropping on the apostles? Did you know that in Finland, uh, they believe that if you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend by Pentecost, you won't have one all summer long. <laughs> Pentecost is a big deal. Uh, Jews from all over the Middle East would come to the holy city, Jerusalem, not Marion, for the Feast of Pentecost. It was a harvest festival. And so you had, uh, you had Jews, uh, Jew, uh, Gentile converts to Judaism, all coming back to the city uh, of Jerusalem. So there's a lot of people there, and the Holy Spirit shows up. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes? Well, it's not what the disciples think should happen. The first disciples, at least in Acts chapter 1, are chained to internal attachments. Uh, they have this God-in-the-box theology, this make the Jews great again philosophy. They are more attached to what they want from God than they are attached to God. And what they want from God is political liberation from Roman occupation and oppression. You can't blame them for that. But they can't see past that. And right after Jesus promises the birthday gift of the Holy Spirit, the first words out of their nationalistic, narcissistic mouth is, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? To make us great again? To put the Jews back on top? I have another birthday song floating through my head. It's uh, Stevie Wonder's birthday song. You know that one? Somebody sing it with me. Happy birthday through, yeah. Happy birthday. I promise that's the last time I'm going to sing during the sermon. That's my last one. Jesus' response to the uh, first apostle's narcissistic question, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel, is not happy birthday to you, but actually happy birthday through you. Here's what Jesus says. Acts 1.8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, the birthday gift of the Holy Spirit, you Jewish Christians, is not just for you, Jews in Jerusalem and Judea, but through you for your enemies in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, which includes those thinking Romans as well. The birthday of the church in Acts sounds a lot like the birthday of the Jews in Genesis. God says to Abraham, basically what Jesus says to the apostles, happy birthday through you. Abraham, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans. Did you ever get a birthday gift that you felt uh, was not just for you, but through you? Like maybe your parents got you a car when you turned 18 and you thought it was a gift for you, but it was really a gift through you, for your parents really, because now you have to drive your siblings back and forth to school and sports. Right? Or maybe your parents got you a, an Atari 2600 video game system for your eighth birthday. And you thought it was a gift for you and you discovered it wasn't. It was a gift through you for your older sister. I'm still a bit bitter 40 years later. 
Well, the Jews are, Jewish Christians are in chains. They think that the blessing is for them, not through them. And they struggle with that. And we know what it's like to be chained. I do. To not only external addictions, but internal attachments. And oftentimes, behind every visible external addiction is an invisible internal attachment to something. And oftentimes, at least for me, it's the idea that God exists to bless me, to make me happy, to favor me, to put me on top. And when I start to get attached to that idea, it's easy for me to, when God disappoints that idea and doesn't do what I think he'll do when I think he's going to do it, it's easy for me to run to some self-pleasuring escapes. People do this all the time. God doesn't do what we expect him to do. We're disappointed, so we run to food or, or Netflix or sex or drugs or alcohol or shopping or work. We get chained up. An attachment is anything we hold on to more tightly than we hold on to God. For the Jews of the Old Testament and the disciples of the New Testament, they were attached more tightly to what they wanted from God than they were to God. I think one of our main theological attachments can tend to be uh, what we think will happen when the Holy Spirit comes. What should happen when the Spirit shows up? You know, for the first 400 years of the church's existence, the main debate had to do with Christology, the identity of Jesus. How human was Jesus? How divine was Jesus? But for the last, I think, 50 years or so, the debate has centered on pneumatology, which is a big word that means the understanding, the uh, study of the Holy Spirit. When I was a, a new Christian at the age of 18, I was weirded out, spooked out by the Holy Spirit. It didn't help that people called the Spirit the Holy Ghost. That actually uh, messed me up even more. And I remember a group of friends from college went to a church that taught that when the Spirit comes, people will be slain with uncontrollable laughter and bark like dogs. It's truth. I've done both of those things, by the way, in middle school math class, and I won't blame the Spirit for that. And then I would see as a new believer on TV, this you know, TV preacher telling me, you know, if you, if you send a thousand, if you sow a seed of a thousand dollars to my ministry, the Holy Spirit will bless you with a financial or relational miracle. You'll get the house of your dreams and the hottie of your dreams. Well, that's not exactly what happens when the Spirit comes, you know? If the Spirit doesn't give us the house of our dreams or the hottie of our dreams. Actually, I did get the hottie of my dreams. Her name is Amy. And, and if we don't bark like dogs and get slain with laughter, what exactly happens when the Holy Spirit comes? Well, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit cuts the chains ugh, of our attachments. And that's what the Holy Spirit did for those first disciples. The same disciples who in Acts 1 are wanting the Jews to be great again for, for the birthday gift to be just to them are when the Holy Spirit comes going out in Acts 2 to preach the good news about Jesus. It says in the text to visitors from Rome, non-Jews, converts, to Judaism, non-Jews. That's weirder than barking like dogs. Still in Acts chapter two, uh, Peter, a racist Jew, if ever there was one, is now uh, affirming and quoting the prophecy of Joel, where God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, including non-Jews. And then at the end of Acts chapter two, verse 39, uh, Peter, again, is saying that the Holy Spirit is not just a birthday gift to the Jews, but through the Jews, to, in his words, to people who are far off. What a miracle. What a miracle that was. I mean, the, the, the book of Acts starts in self-absorbed Jerusalem, but ends in Rome with Paul preaching the good news to the same Romans the Jewish Christians wanted to annihilate in Acts chapter 1. 
The message of Acts, it seems to me, is simply this. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit will cut the chains that keep us stuck in self-absorbed Jerusalem so that we go out and bless all the people of the world. And we've experienced that, haven't we? The chain-cutting power of the Spirit. Most of us in this room probably know what it's like to have our chains cut, chains that bound us to external addictions or internal attachments. But after the Spirit frees us, liberates us, cuts our chains, the Spirit does an odd thing. The Spirit hands us the chain cutters and invites us and empowers us to partner with God in doing for others what he's done for us. How does that happen? How do we partner with the Holy Spirit and cut the chains of those who are in bondage to something? Through the witness of words. That's how. I've read uh, Acts, all 28 chapters, and it's pretty clear to me that when the Spirit comes, the Spirit gives us words of witness, chain-cutting words of witness, the power to say something to someone somewhere about Jesus that sets them free. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes, and the apostles have the capacity to speak a diversity of languages to diverse people about Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John uh, are in prison, They get a chance to speak. The Holy Spirit falls upon them and they speak words about Jesus to the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. In Acts 6 and 7, the Holy Spirit comes upon Stephen and he preaches a long message about Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit comes upon Philip and gives him words of witness for an Ethiopian traveler. In chapter 9, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostle Paul and he's given words to preach in the synagogue. He starts preaching. In Acts 13, the Holy Spirit comes upon a variety of people and scatters them around to preach words, words of witness about Jesus. And then in chapter 19, it says, the Holy Spirit comes upon the Ephesians and they spoke. When the Holy Spirit comes, words happen and chains break. Let me flesh that out a little bit. I was um, dead as a doornail, seriously, zero hope, Uh, battling an addiction to alcohol that was sucking the life out of me, uh, one IPA and shot of Jack at a time. And my money couldn't save me because I had none. My parents couldn't save me because they were battling their own demon, addiction to heroin. My education couldn't save me because I was a high school dropout. And I remember at the age of 18 being attached to this horrific idea that my life would never amount to much of anything at all. That I could die right then and there at the age of 18 and not miss out on anything. What a horrible chain to be bound up in. And that's when it happened. The Holy Spirit nudged people my way with chain-cutting words of witness. Lenny, Jesus loves you. Lenny, Jesus, he will never forsake you, never abandon you, never neglect you, never break up with you, never divorce you. Man, I got to work on my arm strength. (laughs) Basically, what they said to me was, Uh, Len, here's what Christ has done for me. And if he did it for me, maybe he can do it for you. They weren't the most eloquent, but they were authentic. And in the words of Charles Wesley, because of their chain-cutting words of witness, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And right away, after my chains were cut, The Spirit gave me the chain cutters. And I got a chance to partner with Christ in doing for others what he had done for me. And I couldn't shut up about Jesus. 
I mean, I talked about Jesus all the time. And it wasn't out of guilt or, or obligation or legalism. I was in love with Jesus. I was enamored with Jesus. And when you're in love with someone or enamored with someone, you can't shut up about them. You know, it's like when you're expecting your first child and you're so excited, you just keep talking about it. And you're at my, you're talking to the cashier and you're saying, oh, we're going to have a, a baby, a boy in two months and we're naming him Joseph. And she's like, great, you got M perks? You know? <laughs> but then uh, something tragic happens, I think, to many of us. After the, the, the new scent of freedom in Christ wears off, we don't pick up the chain cutters as much. Maybe it's because we get stuck in a sort of bless me mentality. Happy birthday to me. Maybe you can relate. Maybe, maybe uh, the chain cutters are in some corner of your spiritual garage collecting dust. It's time to pick up the chain cutters. We have all kinds of words from all kinds of people today. Divisive, angry, violent words are in abundance. We need words of witness, chain-cutting words about Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the life who is truly life right here, right now. A little church history lesson from the 60s until now. Okay, for, so from the 1960s till I think about maybe 1990s, the church was really good at words of witness. But we weren't as good with works of witness. And words of witness without works of wit witness diminish the words. So we can't just tell people Jesus is the bread of life, words. We have to feed hungry people, works. We can't just tell people uh, in Christ there's neither Jew or Greek, words. We've got to work for reconciliation. We need both. And so when Gen Xers and younger like me came up, we started to talk more about the witness of works, I think. And so we had this beautiful marriage of uh, the witness of words, which we called evangelism, and the witness of works, social action. But I'm afraid that now, 2000s and later, we've made the same mistake the older generations have when they just emphasize the witness of words, sometimes without works, except we've swung the pendulum the other way. And now we're more likely to witness with works without words. What good is it if we fill someone's belly with food, works, and we don't tell them about Jesus who fills the soul? Words. If people just fed me and paid my debts and helped me overcome my addiction, but never told me about Jesus Christ, who is life, I'd still be in chains. Listen, in Acts, there, are, there is the witness of works. I was hoping to preach a message about racial reconciliation and care for the poor and centralizing the marginalized, which is all in Acts, but it's not primary. What's primary is that when the Spirit comes, we get words about Jesus to cut the chains of those who are bound. We've got to stop quoting Francis. <laughs> Preach the gospel all the time. If necessary, use words. We needed that a generation ago. The quote we need today is, preach the gospel all the time. It's necessary to use words. Maybe we've fallen out of love with Jesus and have forgotten how beautiful and generous and gracious and majestic he is. Not Stephen. In Acts uh, 6 and 7, we encounter Stephen. A couple things I want to say about him that are clear. It says he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's enamored with Jesus. And because of both, he just can't shut up about Jesus. And he, and he shares words of witness with this very hostile crowd who's going to stone him to death. 
And while they're ready to stone him to death, all Stephen could see is Jesus. He's got a one-track mind. He says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man, Jesus, standing. Because when you stand up for Jesus with the witness of words, he is standing up for you. Jesus is not some dead Jew from 2,000 years ago. He's not irrelevant and powerless. He is standing. He is large and in charge. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He holds the keys of death and hell. And when the Holy Spirit comes, we get the capacity to see Jesus no matter what's going on around us in the middle of a horrific pandemic, political polarization, violent uh, racial tensions. There, smack dab in the middle, Jesus is standing. And the Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to see Jesus and speak Jesus out of love for people. And Stephen did love the hostile crowd. At the very end, he said uh, "Don't to God, don't hold this against them. <laughs> That's love. So I'm having breakfast with uh, a friend at a restaurant here in Marion. And I get what I uh, sense is a nudge from the Holy Spirit to offer words of witness to our waitress. She just seemed heavy hearted that day. And I tried to suppress the nudge of the spirit beneath my El Rancho skillet, but the spirit, spirit persisted. I relented. After leaving what I hope was a memorably good tip, because the witness of works matters, I went up to the waitress, a little sweaty in my palms, and just said, Ma'am, I don't do this often. That's the truth. That's the sad truth. But I feel compelled, I think by God, to just tell you that you are the apple of God's eye. That Jesus loves you with an everlasting, unconditional love. You're precious to him. For what it's worth, that's it. And she started crying. She said, I'm going through a painful divorce. And I needed to hear that today. And I think that maybe that day, one link in her chain was cut. I want to give us a 24-hour chain-cutting challenge. If you've seen the TV show 24 with Keeper Sutherland, you know that a lot can happen in 24 hours. <laughs> and that's what I'm banking on, actually. What I would like for us to do as a church without guilt or manipulation, but just in awe of Jesus and in love for people, pick up the chain cutters in the next 24 hours and say something to someone somewhere about what Christ has done for you and might do for them too. You don't have to be a, a, a smooth talking car salesman or brilliant theologian. Just tell others what Christ has done for you through a card, a call, a coffee, a conversation. If you are around someone who's stuck in chains and you have a chain cutter, but you just give them a drink of water, <laughs> that's criminal. Say something. In the next 24 hours, say something to someone about Jesus. Who knows what might happen? But you need the power of the Spirit to go with you. And so what we're going to do is uh, to close the service, we're going to have a couple pastors up here to anoint you with oil. If you feel like saying yes to the chain-cutting challenge, I can't imagine us ever saying no to that, quite honestly. Uh, and so come and be anointed with oil. They're just going to put the sign of the cross with oil on your head. Oil has traditionally been a sign of the unleashing power of the Spirit in the believer's life. And so if you're willing to take that 24-hour challenge, chain-cutting challenge, to say something to someone somewhere in the next 24 hours about what Christ has done for you, Card, call, coffee, conversation. Come and be anointed. I love this phrase from Paul in Romans 8. It talks about the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead being alive in us. If the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in us, pill popping, meth smoking, binge eating, stress watching, uh, will lose its appeal. 
If the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in us, in time we will begin to reek of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And, 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 if the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in us, we will pick up the chain cutter, offering words of witness, telling others what Christ has done for us and can do for them too. Happy birthday through 